welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast. With me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. I did everything before I leave. I need to find that bag of McCoy's. Alex Hartley took us off air in Brighton earlier this year. I'm a huge fan of Pepper. We thought we were really funny. Bobby, I'm doing a <laughs> podcast, man. Come on. <laughs> well, my dog is now called Jimmy Anderson. Oh, well, Manchester Originals aren't through to the Eliminators, so I've got to change that to yeah. Do you cook French food? Like, do you cook frog legs and snails? <laughs> oh, I just locked myself in a procedure room. That Sophie Eccleston's the worst. It's like having a child with you when she's on tour. I don't know whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows I'm a little bit stupid. So, Polly, where do we start with all the things that have happened since we last recorded? Well, I think the best place to start is, is the big news that broke just hours after we re recorded the podcast last week, which was that um, former Australia captain Meg Lanning announced her retirement from international cricket. Um, so to make it clear, she will still be playing domestic cricket, I'd imagine in the WNCL and also WBBL. But it's it's a big moment, I think, in, in Australian cricket because she's been a part of the international set of 13 years. And of course, has scored tons of runs, but actually as a captain, has been the most successful captain in the history of the team. And has just, I suppose, been a been a really big figure in Australian cricket for so many years. She has. And her impact is huge. I was trying to think she's a kind of cross between Rachel Hayhoe Flint and Charlotte Edwards for the Australian game. I think just the impact and the success uh, that she's brought but also her personal figures uh, in terms of batting she scored the most international centuries of anyone in history she is a titan of a player and um will be really really badly missed and in a sense is if we went back to the commonwealth games and that point in which they got the gold medal and you said oh you know meg lanning will be gone in 18 months you wouldn't have believed it really because you know she was right at the pinnacle of her career at that point but clearly she's she's had to reevaluate she's had to think about what she has achieved and what she wants to go on to do and this is the decision that she's made and you know we we respect her for that yeah and I think also the thing that's interesting with someone like Meg Lanning who's been so successful is that you think well why would you ever want to stop because you're doing so well but actually it's really tiring to do well and it's tiring to be so successful and to play international cricket for a couple of years let alone 13 years is a huge achievement and it takes a lot um I think particularly with playing for Australia I think there is that bit more pressure perhaps and when you're captaining as well because there's the expectation you're going to win um and there's the expectation to constantly get more trophies win more world cups retain the ashes um and add travel in there add all these other factors in add your own life in and it it just is really quite overwhelming um so yeah she's done a stellar job for Australia um but yeah I think yeah Commonwealth Games getting that gold that's kind of a nice way to kind of wrap up her career and then yeah it'll be nice to see her still play some domestic cricket and it and it helps to give I suppose, a better work-life balance, really, if you're not having to be committed to all that international travel. I don't know whether she'll play much franchise cricket um, or whether she'll try and just stay back in Australia. But, yeah, what she's contributed to Cricket Australia and world cricket is is absolutely fantastic. I mean, effectively, she can choose, can't she? If, if yeah. She can choose to do uh, whatever she wants to do. And so I think that's a really good, healthy position uh, for her to be in. And, and we all we can do is even though she's an Aussie it is say what a what a great player what a great captain we will wait a, a long long time to see anyone achieve what she achieved as a player and achieve what she achieved as a captain and I think the other thing we need to bear in mind for her and for lots of other players is that people tend to start international cricket very young so she herself was in her teens. There's lots of people are, are starting out their careers or going back, you know, 
15 years ago were starting their careers when they were 16, 17, 18 years old. And actually, you need to get to a point in life when you reevaluate and think about what you're going to do. And it reminds me a little bit of Sarah Taylor, where you've got someone who's right at the peak of their career in many ways and is really highly respected, you know, looked on as, as you know, the, the greatest of all time. Um, but actually, you know, she talked about, you know, just desperately not wanting to drive up the motorway to Loughborough anymore. <laughs> and those kinds of things. I and mean, actually, you forget these people are just human beings with ordinary lives and houses that they live in and and things that they want to to do. And cricket can become very all-consuming. Um, so I, I I really respect her for the decision that she's made. And, uh, you know, we wish her well. I, I think we're going to see her around. <laughs> she's she's, she's going to be around for a while, I think. Yeah, well, I did say at the time when, when her, her retirement was announced, I was like, well, I'm sure there'll be many international cricketers particularly bowlers, just having a bit of a breather and being like, "Why? Well, it's, it's all good. I'm never going to have to face her again in international cricket. Um, but speaking of another retirement, we briefly want to touch on Liz Russell, who's retired um, from all cricket, played for Sparks for three seasons and also Warwickshire for a long time and even in the 100 for the Superchargers. Um, and it actually stuck, kind of stuck out to me because it was nice to see Sparks acknowledging her as a player, thanking her, um, and uh, and it wasn't just her putting on social media that she's retiring, and that's how people find out. Um, actually, Sparks put something out there as well, um, which I thought was really really lovely to see. This is progress, isn't it? And this is what we've mm. been talking about for a while. That um, it's really important that uh, regions communicate with their fans about who's joining and who's leaving and they say a thank you to people who's, who are leaving even if it's you know you know some people are leaving because they'll have lost their contract but I think it's really really important that those people are mentioned and honoured and thanked and sent on their way yeah definitely so that was that was a nice thing to see this week among a lot of obviously not necessarily nice that she's retiring but nice to see actually a team honouring a player which I think is really really important we've spoken about that before in previous episodes now, we want to talk about some more difficult things and frustrating things in women's cricket this week. Firstly, we'll touch on France again, because we spoke about that last week with their situation of these alleged fake matches. Now, um, the players from France provided an update and basically said, you know, we want to separate ourselves from French cricket. You know, This is not something we agree with that has been done. And we we want the ICC to get involved and... Uh, to investigate this um and so that will be an ongoing situation but yeah I think it, there's been a bit of traction with that story and a bit of interest uh, but I think as we mentioned last week it is actually quite a familiar story to a lot of associate nations so it is quite shocking to hear that this has been going on in not just France yes I mean the French phrase le gouvernement séparé comes to mind um, <laughs> clearly, the um, the French women cricketers have had enough mm. of essentially being told, well, having their association run by men for men, and and they are very much a, a bolt on um, to that. And I'm really, really pleased that they've um, written this letter and expressed that. You can only hope that the ICC take this seriously now. My fear is that they don't care. Yeah. Um, I mean, and again, it's a group of women, female players saying directly to the ICC, you need to sort out our association because it's not doing its job properly. Does that ring a bell at all, that scenario? Mm. Well, that segues really nicely into a conversation we're going to have about Afghanistan because Jeff Allardyce did an interview uh, recently with Ali Mitchell on BBC Stumps. It was earlier in the week. And he basically said, we don't talk to the players. We've got nothing to do with them. Um, there's nothing we can do about Afghanistan. We don't get involved because this is this is government stuff. We're not involved in that. And it was, it was really frustrating to listen to because, you know, clearly he's not going to sit here and say, 
you know, there's so much we can do because he's not doing anything. So that would be really foolish and stupid. Um, but actually to be like, oh, as a governing body, there is nothing we can do. It does sound a little bit stupid. It was possibly one of the most toe-curlingly embarrassing interviews I've ever heard. It reminded me of, oh, now some listeners will know about this and others won't. It reminded me of um, Home Secretary Michael Howard on Newsnight being interviewed by Jeremy Paxman about 20 years ago, uh, or possibly more than that, and it, where he asked the same question over and over, oh, over yeah. and he refused to answer it. And it was just, it was awful. How that, I mean, if I were him, I would be embarrassed by what I was having to say on you know, an international respected cricket podcast to one of the top women's cricket journalists in the world. It just, it didn't stack up at all, essentially saying this is nothing to do with us. We don't deal with players, we deal with associations. Uh, the, the association, they have to follow the laws of the land. And especially because of what subsequently happened only what 48 hours after that interview, when the ICC suspended Sri Lanka cricket because of government interference in the cricket board. Yeah, it is. It's so just mind blowing that it, it, like, I think the way everything happened with that interview coming out and then the whole Sri Lanka thing, it was just like, you're telling me two different stories here. And it and it doesn't add up. And we knew it wasn't adding up. And we knew we know there's stuff that can be done. Um, but I think also with that interview, the thing that struck me, and I know he's there to say a script, you know, I, I get that. But I think actually how um kind of non-human it came across and the fact that, you know, Ali Mitchell was talking about people she's spoken to, real women from Afghanistan who have been through something horrible now can't play cricket and are being denied that right and he was basically like kind of like we don't really care there's nothing we can do grouped these women together as if you know they almost don't exist um and I guess maybe in his job he he can't think about the individuals because then the lack of what's being done it makes him feel guilty or something I don't know but it was it was really hard to listen to because at the end of the day, this comes down to a group of women who are being denied a right and for someone to sit there and be like, well, there's nothing I can do about that. And I'm he he wasn't saying it was really a bad thing. He he let it he absolutely let it go. So it was, yeah, very, very difficult to listen to. Um, but a really good job by Ali Mitchell of, of, of trying to get stuff out of him. What you look for from a governing body is integrity and consistency. And at the moment, we're getting neither of those things from the ICC. There's no integrity there. There's no consistency there. They make arbitrary decisions based on what someone somewhere has decided. And it has no sense whatsoever. There, there is absolutely no reason why Afghanistan should retain full member status when they have stopped fulfilling the requirements for being full members. It's very, very simple. The moment they stopped having a women's team is the moment their full membership should have ended. Yeah. Yeah, it is frustrating because Afghanistan men did quite well at the World Cup. So a lot of people were talking about them and praising the team, praising the board, all those sort of things. And But it's like, do you... Are you absolutely clueless to what's happening with the women's team right now? Um, because there there was an interview, um, it was with Katia Whitney on the Wisdom podcast with one of the Afghan players, and it, it was really interesting. And, and she was asked the question actually, do you want the men's team to not be allowed to play? And she was like, Well, well, no, like the, the men's team should be allowed to play. All we're asking is that we can play. Um, she was like, I want to play cricket in my country, representing my country. And actually, that's a really, that's a basic thing to ask. You know, they're, they're not asking for loads and loads of things and they should be allowed to ask for loads of things. Um, but it, it was kind of, it was quite sad hearing it from an individual who's been directly affected by it and who this is entirely about. Um, so yeah, kind of a, 
a pessimistic update uh, regarding Afghanistan. And um, yeah, and if the ICC it, wanted to do something about it, they could. They could, yeah. You know, even on a positive, you know, if they let the Afghanistan men keep their full membership but directed funding towards the women's team and let them play under a neutral flag. I think they'd all accept it. It, it wouldn't be an ideal, but we're not, you know, we're not living in an ideal world when the Taliban runs your country and women are banned from education and sporting activity and so on. But it's actually something which means that that team, which was started by funding from the ICC, can continue. And actually that gives hope. And it shows to the women's game that it is equally valued as the men's game is. And at the moment, the message that's been given is that the women's game is not equally valued by the ICC. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, we'll finish on a positive note. We'll chat about the England squads for uh, the India series. So I believe the A squad are already in Oman uh, training ahead of, they've got a couple of T20s against India A. So that squad is um it's a really nice mix actually because we've got some older players and kind of I suppose fringe players of the England team. So for example, um Mahika Gore's in there, Lauren Filer, so players that, that have appeared over the summer. But then you have names like Georgia Davis from Central Sparks, Liberty Heap, who is part of England and the 19 team, um, Freya Kemp returning from injury. But then you also have names like Holly Armitage, who's been in excellent form over the last few seasons captains um the northern superchargers and northern diamonds and so there's a really kind of nice mix of players and i think they've done it really well that this really is an a squad and it's not just players they want to kind of test out like that could play for england now sort of thing yeah and you suspect maybe if georgia adams was not playing the wbbl maybe she i'd like to think that she would have featured um, in that as well you know if I were Eve Jones I would feel slightly peeved that I you know that I didn't make it into that list you know looking at those are players of her generation you know she's been in and around a squads and in, in the past but really excitingly what's what's great to see is the number of the under 19 team who have now kind of graduated into that um, a squad yeah, I think there are four of them because there's Saren Smell and Liberty Heat from Thunder and then Hannah Baker and Grace Scribbins. So there is a bit of a mix there. The other addition actually in the A squad, which I'm excited to see, is Izzy Wong. So it's I'm glad she's in the A squad rather than this, the full squad um, just because it gives her a chance to get confidence again and be in that team environment with England. And yeah, like she had a rubbish summer and she said that herself but actually this is an opportunity to kind of find a groove again and get back into it because we like watching her play and you know no one ever wants to see a player out of form um so yeah I'm glad she's been taken there and yeah she can kind of get ready for next summer yeah I mean it's interesting when you talk about confidence in Izzy Wong because I just can't <laughs> imagine Izzy Wong without uh, confidence she's possibly on the surface, one of the most confident people I've I've ever seen on, on the pitch. But it's in terms of her rhythm, something went badly wrong last year. So we're looking for that mojo to be very much back as we uh, kick into the A games and um, and then into next season. Yeah, I guess also you can look like such a confident player, but internally, actually when things start to go wrong, it gets really difficult. Like, I don't think there are many people in the world psychologically that can just move past it and get on with it. I think that takes a bit of time. Um, but no, it's, it's good to see her in there. And also Beth Heath. Um, interestingly, so she's in the T20 squad and the Test squad. Um, so that that's an interesting selection, I think. It is, yeah. And, and she's out in the WBBL at the moment and doing very, very well. Um, as well so um, yeah it, it's it's really really good to see these developments happening and there's foresight isn't there so not all of the players in the who get selected for an A squad are going to take the next step but to actually give these players a chance and just to be part of that you know England setup to mix with 
the the main squad at times and so on i think is really really good it, it just means there's this one team england mentality that's kind of coming through whoever you bring in in the in the future they've been part of that setup before yeah it's nice to see um maddie villiers and kirsty gordon as well back in the mix who of course have a handful of england caps i think maddie's played more recently than kirsty but again just kind of more opportunities for them um so yeah it'll be exciting to see how that pans out because that starts in a couple of weeks time uh the a games will start and then early december it's the the t20s and the test so we'll see how that all goes um but yeah i guess i think these squads are quite reflective of, of the stage england are at because i suppose we've known for the last couple of months they've been almost in this transition phase particularly in their bowling department with Catherine Silverbrunt and Anya Shrubsoul retiring, obviously massive shoots to fill. Uh, we know that. And I know England have had to test out a lot of different players over the past few months to kind of figure out who who those replacements are, even the past few years. Um, and I guess with the T20 World Cup coming up and things like that, there's a lot to plan ahead to. Um, and with John Lewis coming in as well, I suppose he will have different preferences to Lisa Kitely and things like that. Um so I think there's a lot of change for England and, and that's quite difficult. And I think we kind of saw that with the Sri Lanka series that, you know, it does take a bit of time to get used to. But it's exciting um, because I think there's a lot of potential within this team. Um, and yeah, within the A squad as well, there's just in every kind of department of cricket, there's there's so much talent there. Yes. And, and I think playing a test match in India, I think they need to pack the pickle juice. <laughs> yeah. Um, and looking at, I just think two spinners, please, two spinners. Um, Sophie Eccleston coming back from injury. Let's not bowl her, you know, sixty overs in each innings. <laughs> let's um, let's give Charlie Dean a, a chance as well. And uh, and I guess there's the opportunity of rotating round as well. Uh, you know, if Alice Capsi's playing, um, or Emma Lamb, or uh, Heather Knight, of course. Um, it, it would be really, really good to um, to take the burden off Sophie Eccleston and not completely uh, damage her. Well, and, and Charlie Dean is really popular in India, I've heard. So, you know, <laughs> 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 to be fair. Well, yes. Yeah. But no, I would love to see her play in the test match. And I think it, it would be wise to put her and Eccleston rather than Eccleston on her own because as soon as the squads came out I did say to you I was like please can Eccleston not do 60 overs on her own again I know it was her other shoulder not her bowling shoulder mm -hmm. um but I don't care <laughs> um yeah protect Eccleston at all costs yes so it, it'll be really interesting it'll be interesting to play India in India conditions as well I, I think it's going to be really quite challenging and um, it'll be really interesting to see how the how the team managed to deal with that. Now we've got quite a heartwarming episode actually um, for you today, so with our guests. So we spoke to Miriam Faisal, who plays for Scotland, played for Scotland under nineteen at the under nineteen World Cup, um, and we had a lovely chat with her. She is absolutely incredible not only is she playing international cricket she is also a first year medicine student um which yeah I can't quite comprehend because that is very very busy um but yeah we had a lovely chat with her about I suppose it, a lot of it was about her granddad and the importance of kind of where her cricket came from um and his legacy um with her and her twin brother and and how they play their cricket so enjoy our chat with Miriam So to start off, what's your cricket story and how did you first get involved with cricket? Okay, so um, my granddad used to play cricket for Pakistan. He was 50th Test cricketer for Pakistan. And after he retired, he would manage the Pakistan cricket teams and he was also an ICC match referee. So when I was around about eight years old, we went to go, no, I think it was six actually, when I was six, we went to watch Pakistan play Sri Lanka in uh, Dubai and my granddad was managing the Pakistan cricket team. And 
my brother absolutely fell in love with the sport like he, he we're twins so um he loved it and as soon as we came back like my parents had to put him in a cricket club and I actually didn't really know what was going on I, I fell asleep through that game but um uh, like afterwards like, I just joined the club because my brother played cricket and he wanted to do it and I just wanted to do whatever he was doing and for the first five years I actually hated it I didn't enjoy cricket at the start but I don't know I think one season I just decided to give it a proper go and yeah it's kind of just went from there. That's really interesting because you said essentially you started doing something which you really didn't like and you kept doing it for five years until you liked it (laughs) that's really unusual because people usually just give up so that seems to me to say that you had some sort of sense of I don't know obligation or just stubbornness that you didn't want to stop doing something your brother was doing. It was more like I had tried multiple times to try and get my parents like tell my parents I didn't like this and I didn't want to do this anymore but they were like no you're going to stick to the sport you're going to keep on playing and like at one point I just went to trainings just to talk to the coaches like I never actually trained but um I'm glad that they did that because I absolutely love the sport now. Wow and and you're pretty good at it as well it would appear as as your career has, um, has progressed. So tell me how cricket works a little bit in Scotland, because I guess for a lot of people, they don't really associate Scotland with cricket. Yeah, uh, that is quite a common um, perception of Scottish cricket. So for me, like throughout my whole pathway, so I obviously started off playing boys cricket when um, when I first like got into cricket. And I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't actually like it as much, because I was the only girl at my club. And I think around about the age of uh, 12, I got selected for the district team which is western warriors um so like like the regional teams and that's the west regional team for scotland and it was the under 15s or under 16 squad that i got selected for that kind of um was like my first exposure to like a team where it was only girls from there i got um told i should join a women's club and the only closest women's club was west of scotland because my current my men's club which is clydesdale didn't have a women's team at the time and in Scotland, you have two women's leagues. Now you have like a women's prem and then you have the challenger league. And if you want to play um, international cricket, you have to play in the women's prem. And Clydesdale's current women's team isn't part of the women's prem team. So I had to move. Well, I, well, I play for both clubs. I play men's for Clydesdale and I play women's prem for West of Scotland. And that's kind of how the wo- like women's programme works in Scotland. So you've got your regional stuff. We've got your club, so women's prem, then you have your regional and then obviously your national, international and national pathways. Yeah, it's good to have someone explain that to us because we've touched on it with a couple of players before, but actually understanding how that, because a lot of people will say, well, I played, you know, Scotland under 17s and then, you know, I had a senior career and that's the end of it. But yeah, understanding yeah. kind of everything in between is great. And we'll get onto senior stuff in a minute, but chat to us a bit about the under 19 World Cup uh, back in January. Because that was a huge opportunity just because of how many countries there were. And it was the first uh, under-19 World Cup for women's teams. So a fantastic opportunity to kind of showcase what you can do. Yeah, the under-19s World Cup was probably one of the biggest stages I've ever played on in my whole life. And it was a completely different experience from anything I've been through before. Like playing in stadiums, which I like no Scotland under-19 team, like girls especially, has ever done. And to be the first ever Scotland women's team to ever qualify for a World Cup was also just a big, like, showed how important that um, tournament was for us. And our, we were very close as a team as well, which also just made the experience just so much more better. And it was great playing against some of the best players in the world, like playing against Shafali Verma, watching her bat. It was just an unreal experience. I mean, it was a, it, we loved that tournament so much. And, and I think one of the things... I liked about it. I mean, the cricket was great, but just to see the camaraderie that was going on, it just felt like it was a whole load of young people who'd gone away and were having the time of their lives and couldn't quite believe their luck that all this was going on around them. Yeah, it was also just a great opportunity to speak to players from other countries. Like um, one of the girls in my, in our under 19 squad made a lot of friends with like the girls in the UAE team. Mm -hmm. And then just in general, when we go on tours, just going to go speak to them and understanding how cricket works in their countries is also just really interesting and uh, well I've never met personally um someone who's studying medicine and doing cricket at the same time but when I went away with the Scotland women's I'd like met my first ever cricketer but another cricketer who actually did medicine and international cricket at the same time and it just felt good to know that there were other people doing the same. Yeah it, it, that's absolutely amazing isn't it to, 
uh, to think that the way that people balance the different parts of uh, their careers and, and the where cricket is at in different parts of the world. So you were part of that uh, tournament. And Scotland did, as, as you said, it, you know, some tough games, but uh, you did reasonably well. In fact, very famous victory against USA. I seem to yeah. recall uh, right at the end, which was which is absolutely brilliant. But things have gone from strength to strength for you, haven't they? Because um, recently you've made your full Scotland debut. Yeah, I, I made my debut back in September. Um, it was at the European uh, World Cup qualifiers and I made my debut against Italy. I was very nervous, actually. Um, my debut actually meant quite a lot to me because um, just a few weeks before my debut, my granddad had passed away and he was the like the main part of my cricket, like the reason why I'd gotten so far and just why I'd even started playing the sport in the first place. And a lot of the cricket that I now play is just all because of him and to go out and like, do what I had always dreamed of doing and told them that I would always like dream of doing at some point in my life was just a big moment for me. And just in, like, even when my, during my cap speech, my granddad was mentioned and it was, it was quite an emotional tournament, but it was just also just a big milestone in life and a great start to my cricket journey. Cricket is one of these things that does run through families and generations, doesn't it? And, and I guess there are so many stories of people who were, um, inspired by their dads or their their granddads or, or you know the whole families uh, that play and, and it seems to me that there, it, there's something about cricket which is quite um, I don't know it, it has these emotional pauses available for it so things like the cap presentation or things like the guard of honour for people who are retiring and uh, maybe it's to do with the format of the sport but I just think they're they're absolutely lovely moments and they kind of make the whole thing a bit more um human in a way it, I, I totally agree with that actually i think there's a lot of moments that you see even in international cricket where i think family is quite interconnected in the sport like for example i think nasim shah before his debut his mother had passed away and just how much his debut had meant to him because of that and even just a debut on its own is a big deal but the fact that when you have that emotion from from family background as well with you I think it just makes it all so much more special yeah so it, it, so you played against uh, Italy now it, I seem to remember Scotland did really quite well in that tournament yeah. didn't they? so uh, how did you actually perform on your debut on my debut I actually didn't get to do very much because um, <laughs> Elsa Lister was smacking them about and I just came in and I think it was just I think we only need like 10 runs and I just made five off two balls not out that's really it um but yeah short and sweet I guess and then um the next few games were a bit tough I didn't perform as well as I wanted to but I guess it's just first time being on like playing with a new team and playing at like the Scotland women level so I guess it's just a lot to learn and a lot to take from it and hopefully just the next time do better and were you part of the ODI series against Ireland as well yes I I was I played in the third ODI. So, I, I mean, tell me what, because that's really different from playing a T20, isn't it? T tell us what that was like, that long format game. It was definitely quite tough because um, Spain is obviously very warm. And at that time, it was really, really windy as well. So you had like the heat and then the dust just all hitting your face, especially when you're fielding for 50 overs. So it was hard to just um, obviously keep on going. But I think it was probably one of the, my most enjoyable fielding uh, innings possible I, I, like it came second after the South Africa one that we had at the under 19 World Cup but uh yeah it was that was a pretty good game as well and then batting wise it was just being more patient I think one of the things about me is I'm not a very patient batter and just having to force yourself to be in that mindset of yes I need to stay in a bit longer and it's okay if you dot up is just something that I had to keep on telling myself throughout the time I was batting. And tell me a little bit about some of the other players in the Scotland team who are kind of good examples to you as to how, how to develop your cricket career. I think one of the best examples, as we saw from that ODI series, was Catherine Bryce. She had consistently hit over 50 in three games. And just the way that she batted, she kept building in innings, even when our own wickets were continuously falling. And just the way that she was able to stay at the crease but still score runs at the same time was just something that our whole squad could learn from. The Bryce sisters are just amazing, aren't they? They're, <laughs> they are. there, are, there are so many 
really good players in in that Scottish team already. And then you look at this generation that's developing through and you think, actually, you know, you, you could really develop into a very, very um, good major cricket force. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential in Scotland, especially in the last recent years with so much more women's cricket becoming so much more popular. Like with the introduction of more girls playing in the women's prem, now you have the development, well, the Challenger League as well to allow girls to, like, before it used to be, like, the Prem and that's it. So you'd have girls who had just started playing cricket playing in a, a level that was maybe a bit too difficult for them and that could deter them from playing more. But the fact that now we have more leagues for women and more opportunity is also just going to help to encourage more girls to play cricket but then also continue playing it for a long time as well. And what was it like making that jump from playing, I suppose, Scotland in 19 and a lot of club cricket, regional cricket, to them playing international cricket in games that really matter and World Cup qualifiers. Do you think that Under-19 World Cup kind of prepared you for that sort of pressure? I think it did, because playing at... Obviously, the Under-19 World Cup was one of the biggest um, tournaments I've ever played in, and it was probably one of... that had the most, um, I'd say, publicity as well, because it was everywhere. And I think that did really prepare me for have, making my debut as well, because you were already in, like everyone's eyes that like everyone had seen you play and it was just more that it was the same thing but just with a new team but the Scotland women were so nice and they're really really welcoming and they really made you feel like you're a part of the team so I didn't really feel out of place or having to feel like I had to adapt in some way but I felt completely comfortable throughout it. Now many um, cricketers focus on developing this uh, amazing career but you are focusing on developing two amazing careers at the moment. Tell me a little bit about your, what you're doing at university. So I'm currently studying medicine so I'm in first year. I just started in September. Uh, so far it's been quite busy. It is def definitely very hard to balance at the moment especially with the fact that most of our trainings are in Edinburgh and Dundee and I'm all the way up in Aberdeen. So I'm not able to make every single training due to travel. And then with how our trainings are also during the week, I can't make them either because I have lectures or labs or placements, which I have to go to. So it's just trying to get a fine balance between doing both. It is quite difficult and I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's very, very tiring, but I worked hard to try and get into medicine and there's a lot of hard work put into cricket as well. And I don't want to have to throw one of them away so I'm going to try and keep them going for as long as I can yeah I mean it, it, it's it's a big challenge in, in a sense I think you chose the wrong course Polly's doing journalism it's a dodder <laughs> it she, she gets time. Mondays and Fridays off <laughs> she no, hardly I has just, to do any assignments I, never, I just never expected my cricket to boost so quickly and so fast that I always the like after the 19 World Cup I it wasn't one of my best performances so I just really didn't think that cricket was going to be like something that I would go really far in but um, I think you, I started playing cricket without pressure and I started to enjoy it a lot more as well like I think this season was one of my most enjoyable seasons and because of that I think I just played a lot better and I think when you start enjoying things like things just start working out in their own way and then I got my debut and then got into medicine as well at the same time and I was just like well Go try to keep these both going, I guess. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it, that will be a challenge. But I, I, we have this bit of a joke in our podcast that I always ask the education question and say, you've got to make sure you get your qualifications. Uh, uh, yeah. you know, with the, these youngsters saying they're just going to be professional cricketers and that'll be it. Uh, so I, I think you're, you're doing the right things, it seems to me. Um, but it is going to be really, really challenging. And I guess as you go al along with it, it's going to, it's going to present you with a lot more uh, dilemmas as you go through you know when you've got placements and you've got exams and you've got cricket games yeah. and you've been selected for this and that and the other and um yeah it, it's um it's a difficult one yeah it is but um I enjoy them both a lot and I really want to keep both of them going so I think I'll just keep working hard I guess and just go with the flow at the moment so your your twin brother does he is he still playing cricket yeah so he's in the Scotland under 19 squad so he was part of the, um, he played in the qualifiers that they just had, the European ones for his World Cup that they qualified for. And now he's got his World Cup in Sri Lanka in January. But it hasn't been selected for the full team yet? Not yet. They haven't done the selection yet. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's a very, very good cricketer. He um, 
files for Warwickshire second eleven at the start of the um this year, but he's been very unlucky with injuries, so has um not been able to perform as well as he wanted to because he's just constantly going through recovery. But mm. yeah, he's a very bright cricketer and he's smart as well. Oh, he's not doing medicine as well, is he? No, he's doing aeronautical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> You said that so casually, as if oh, no, there's normal things to do. That's I mean, I just impressive. think it's really, it, it's really unfair that the the talent in this world is not equally spread out. Some people just get it in <sighs> spades for for loads of different things. And so he say he's had you know had trials of Warwickshire and stuff. So do you think uh, you might be tempted if given the opportunity to uh, to look to play down in England, uh, you know, in the regional cricket or in franchise cricket, for example? I would love to. I would absolutely love to go play down south, especially in the regional. I, I, I've seen the regional programmes and we played against them as well in our Scotland Day games. And just the level and playing against like a more challenging opposition more regularly is something that I really want to be exposed to a lot more because up here, if you want to do that at a club cricket level, you want to try and play more men's cricket, which is good, but isn't necessarily like, it's always very long games and not always the best, but just being able to play those, but with girls down south, just looks a lot better and just a lot more um, interesting. And you're just exposed to a lot more players because in the regional programs down south, you also have international players taking part in those as well. And I think that would just be a great opportunity to play against some of them as well. Well, you see, um, it seems to me that increasingly the way is open, isn't it? We were chatting to Hannah Rainey a couple of weeks ago. And um, in fact, there's an example of someone who <laughs> yeah. was veterinary science, wasn't she, that, that, that she did. But the, the ways that seems to be opening for her, you know, to develop something uh, with Thunder, um, you know, and, and she's taken that risk of stepping away from being a vet in order to uh, to see how the cricket goes. And so it, it seems to me that there's there's that chance to develop the career and, you know, and look at developing your cricket at the same time. Yeah, I think one of the difficulties of obviously becoming a sportsman is the fact that it's not a long career and it's also just it's also very risky so I think it's always good to have some sort of backup but um I guess me and Hannah just decided to pick a very demanding backup as well but well it, Mariam it's been absolutely brilliant to speak to you and I think I feel really sort of touched really about this legacy of your granddad that it, it, he's had that you know, impact and influence on on generations of your family, you know, and, and that you're carrying that on. And I think that's, I think it's such a lovely story, if you like. And that, you know, even though he's, um, you know, lived and, and grown up in Pakistan, then, you know, you and you've lived up and grown up in Scotland, but you've still got this love uh, for for cricket, which has been this great um, sort of sport that's run through your family through those generations. Yeah, I think one of the biggest part, as I said before, is that my granddad is the reason we started playing cricket and just his legacy is something that me and my brother are, is our aim to just continue for as long as we can because he was a great man and a great cricketer and he made a big impact on a lot of young cricketers' lives as well when he was part of selection committees in Pakistan and just in general when he was um, like when he was playing and when he was on media channels and everything and just the way that he impacted other people's lives, it just shows just how much of an inspiration he was. And he was also just a very humble person and he'd never tell us this. And it was only until after his death that we all realised that what he had done when we'd had people calling us and telling us about the impact that he had on his their lives, and it just just makes us feel really honoured to have been related to someone like him. Yeah, and, and the fact that he was so encouraging to you as a girl to get involved in cricket as well. Yeah. When I could imagine that culturally there may be one or two people that would frown on that uh, but but very much he was in favour of it yeah he was it was never a barrier for him between women and uh, men in cricket at all just whenever he'd talk about me and my brother playing he'd talk about us equally actually sometimes he'd talk about me a bit more I think he was he was very very proud of me like uh, and just like there's obviously a general conception that boys cricket's more important and that would show a lot in our when discussing it with family like they would take more importance to Ibrahim's cricket but when it came to my granddad it would just be talking about me like when he would go on his talk shows he would somehow slip my name in somehow just somehow and it was just always nice to know that there was like there is that support there 
and he was also always very very um, adamant on trying to get a female PSL program going in Pakistan as well and he would like always tell me about um how he was going to try and get that done obviously he didn't get the chance to and I'm hoping that Pakistan Cricket Board will start that at some point but it was good to know that there was someone who advocated for women in cricket so much. What a legacy. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. We really, really do appreciate it. And, Thank you uh, so much for the opportunity. Oh, no problem. And, um, you know, we look forward to seeing how things develop for you in the year ahead. That was amazing, Polly. That was absolutely brilliant. In fact, it reminded me of the interview we did ages and ages ago with Sophia Smale. Uh, and she talked very movingly then about her granddad and the impact that he'd had on her career. So I think that's that's a really great relationship, isn't it? Grandfathers and granddaughters in cricket. To be fair, it was a miracle I didn't cry this time. <laughs> Actually held it together for once. So <laughs> proud of myself for that one. Well, Polly, will we be back next week with another episode? We will be back next week. In fact, tomorrow morning we are recording it at 6.30 a.m. Um, so take your guesses as to who it is. I mean, you can guess kind of based on the time zone where in the world they're from. Um, but I th- this is the this is the one you've been waiting for for a while. Um, and I finally got it in the bag. So look forward to that next week. Um, but in the meantime, you can follow us on our social media. So our Instagram and TikTok is Naughty Child Podcast and our Twitter or X is Child Podcast.